Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. I, yeah, like I was just saying, I'm up against Dr. Mamalakis, so really, <laughs> I'm glad you're here because he is so awesome. <laughs> but hopefully you'll get a lot out of this workshop. This is a little bit different from the workshops that I've been going to for the last couple days. And uh, we're going to really get down to some nitty-gritty about how to live your lives on a daily basis. And I hope that this will get very personal to you and uh, that it will mean a lot to you. And hopefully we'll have time for a lot of questions. So first of all, I wanted to talk about the resiliency in body and worship because I think that, I, well, as Orthodox Christians, I know that we want to worship God with every fiber of our being. We want to give everything to him, and we know that everything belongs to him, right? But I think that a lot of times we do forget the body. So let's just talk about the body. Now, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Now, of course, St. Paul was talking about sexual immorality, but I think that the overall umbrella theme here is that your body is not your own. It says that plain and clear. So no matter how you're going to use it, if you're going to use it for him, or if you're going to use it for yourself or for other people, I mean, you really have a choice to make. And I think that um, we need to look at it, and this is just something I struggle with. I look at it as a vehicle that he has loaned me for while I'm on this earth. It does not belong to me. And just like Metropolitan Isaiah said the first night, you know, a lot of people will mutilate the outsides of their body for self-expression. Well, I mean, this is tough to hear, but I consider a lot of us mutilating the insides of our body. And that's what's leading us to so much disease and so many issues that we're dealing with today. And a lot of these issues can be prevented and they can even be turned around, which is really the cool part. It's never too late, and we're going to get into that. So the beauty of orthodoxy is that orthodox Christians believe the body is holy. We baptize with water, we anoint with oil, we sprinkle with holy water, we consume the Eucharist, the body and blood, into this body, this earthly body. We're against abortion, no cremation, we expect the resurrection. So how much more blatant can you be, right? This body is God, scripturally and in our faith. Um, as opposed to the Gnostics, for instance, who thought that the body was evil and that it was just something to, you know, dispose of. It was just a necessary evil to dispose of at the end, right? So we make decisions every day um, to support the body, to nurture the body, to call it God's own or to call it our own. But let's look at communion prayers. Before we go to communion, this is a part of one of the prayers we say, right? May the communion of thy holy mysteries be neither to my judgment nor to my con condemnation, O Lord, but to the healing of soul and body. And then afterwards, may the communion of thy holy mysteries be neither to my judgment nor to my condemnation, but, Lord, to the healing of soul and body. O Master, who lovest mankind, who for our sakes didst die and rise again and gave us those awesome and life-creating mysteries for the good and sanctification of our souls and bodies, let them, them be for the healing of our soul and body. And then the last prayer by um, Simeon, penetrate into my members all my joints, my organs, my heart, and burn like thorns all my iniquities. Cleanse my soul, hallow my thoughts, make firm my knees and my bones as well. And let this Eucharist be to my joy, health, and gladness. So how much more specific do we need to get that when we take the body and blood of Christ into our bodies, it's for our health, it's for our healing, right? And then, how many of us go into coffee hour and have donut holes and pop and just stick things in our mouth, drink things that are not to the good of our body, that actually break our bodies down, that dichotomy just, um, it always just rings true to me. And I guess it's because of the profession I'm in <laughs> that every time I see this happen, I just want to cry. Um, but we, ha we do have a choice. And along with our um, free will and making choices of whether we sin or not sin every day, we also have choices um, with our bodies to sin against our bodies or to change. And that's what we want to talk about today is change because there's hope in this message. 
God made our bodies resilient. Our bodies want to heal themselves. We just have to do the right thing and get out of the way, and that's the beauty of it. And did you know, I'm sure you do, but every seven years, every cell in our body turns over. So every seven years, we are a whole new person. So I started my health journey when I was 53 years old. I had a lot of health issues, getting to the bottom of these issues. It's a prog, you know, it's progress. I'm figuring things out, moving along the way. By the time I'm 60, I'm going to be better than I, when I was 35. I cannot wait to be 60. How many people are dreading getting older because they just look at the body falling apart as part of what, you know, that's just what happens, right? But there's so much that can be prevented. Well, we all know that the body is holistic. Our health is holistic. Now, when I was in school, and excuse the blurriness of the slide, it's not your eyes, don't worry. <laughs> but when I was in school, we had sort of a similar diagram. And in the middle was self. And then there were spokes coming out. And physical, financial, social, intellectual. And spiritual was one of those spokes. So at the school I went to, um, it was just made so clear that we are the center of the universe, right? And everything stemmed from that. And this is where I realized that I was a minority, first of all, in my school as a Christian, because everyone was referring to the universe and your higher power, and even doctors and scientists and researchers who were my teachers, who I knew were Christians, they still would never say God because they didn't want to offend anybody. And that's why I do what I do, because we just need to bring this to the Christian community. There's a lot of woo-woo out there where scientific studies and things are just like, um, I don't know, they become new agey. And, and you should be careful of these things, but I want to bring to you what science backs up. Don't make it woo-woo, make it as God's miracle of his creation that some of these things you know, are really legitimate. So I see ourselves as a spiritual person, and everything else revolves around who we are in Christ. Now, there are a few different areas that give us hope today. Number one is the study of epigenetics. I am so into epigenetics, and, and I'm actually getting an advanced uh, certification in nutrigenomics so that people who come to me who have had their genetics done I'll be able to say, you know, your body isn't producing this certain enzyme because of this certain gene, and so here's what we can do with your lifestyle. So it's very exciting. We now know that our genes load the gun, but our lifestyle pulls the trigger. We have the power to either turn these genes off or on. Only 5%, 5 to 10% of all cancer is gene-based. So I don't know if you've known people who have said, well, you know, diabetes runs in my family. I have diabetes, so I'm on medication, and yeah, I'll, t I'll take that, uh, that donut, you know, because diabetes runs in my family. There's nothing I can do about it, so I'll just take the meds and, and live my life the way I want. Now we know we can turn off those genes. It's not a death sentence. And then there's stress. Stress comes from so many different areas. It comes from environmental pollution, it, mental, uh, physical stress, people who work out all the time and are really like, I don't know if you know people like this, like I do, where they'll go to the gym two hours a day and then they'll go for a four-hour or four-hour, four-mile run at night and they're just going, going, going. That creates stress. Of course, food creates stress. And we now know that stress causes inflammation in our bodies. And we're going to cover this later, but inflammation is one of the roots and one of the main roots of disease. So we have to take stress very, very seriously in all of its different forms. Another area we're going to cover is gut dysfunction. Now, a lot of things are happening in our gut, and here are just a few. Nutrient deficiencies. The state of our gut can create an environment where we're actually not, it, it doesn't matter how much we eat, our bodies are not absorbing those nutrients. Hormone imbalances are a default of that. Bacteria imbalance from all the preservatives and everything, we'll talk more about that. Lowered immune systems are a result. Inflammation, again, inflammation leads to disease, but then the good news is, see, this is all good news. We can make so many changes in our lifestyle that can actually turn this stuff around. 
So let's go back to Hippocrates. Born 460 before Christ, the ancient Greek physician Hippocrates is called the father of medicine. He changed the course of Greek medicine with his certainty that disease was not caused by gods or spirits, but was the result of natural action. He said illnesses do not come upon us out of the blue. They are developed from small daily sins against nature. When enough sins have accumulated, illnesses will suddenly appear. All disease begins in the gut. Now, see, isn't this incredible? This is from 460 BC, and just recently, we're talking about the gut. First of all, we're talking about the gut as being the second brain because they're realizing that um, information coming up the, from the gut goes into the brain just as much as what's coming down from the brain goes into the gut. This was a few years ago. Now they're calling our gut our first brain. They're realizing that more information is actually coming into our brains from our gut than vice versa. That's where our home hormones are, our feel-good hormones, serotonin, dopamine, etc. So the gut is so important. And look, way back then, Hippocrates was t- trying to tell us, everyone has a doctor in him or her. We just have to help it in its work. The natural healing force within each one of us is the greatest force in getting well. Our food should be our medicine, and our medicine should be our food. And we're going to talk more about that. Just as food causes chronic disease, it can be the most powerful cure. And the symptoms of most diseases represent efforts of the body to eliminate toxins. So everything that's wrong with us really needs to be looked at as a symptom, not a disease. It's your body communicating with you, hey, there's something wrong here, let's take care of it. You have high blood sugar, there's a body system that needs to be looked at. Not necessarily, um, you know, stop eating sugar and take this medication or et cetera. We need to get to the root causes, the actual body systems. That's where we need to go. And that's how I do most of my health coaching is through a functional medicine uh, perspective where we do work through body systems. So let's get practical. What can we do? Well, the first thing we have to do, of course, is make the commitment. I know it's like swimming upstream against the current, But if you make the commitment in your life, you can definitely make changes that are going to serve you long term. Take action, and I'm going to talk about how to do that. Fall down, get back up again, just like we've been talking this whole weekend. And just keep learning because new studies are coming out all the time. And you know what I found? These new studies are typically really good news. Things that uh, we used to think about diet and nutrition, for instance, and even exercise and, and the old adage, calories in, calories out, which is not true at all. This is all good news. We have more control than we think. So let's start with stress. Is it really that bad? Well, I don't know about you, but I I even find myself saying this. Someone will say, oh, Cynthia, how are you doing? How are you doing today? I'm so stressed out. (laughs) We just get used to saying these things, right? We need need to come up with a different... um, response and a different attitude about this. We need to look at overwhelm as being something that can be managed and have tools to manage it rather than just allowing ourselves to be stressed because what they found in studies is that stress has become glamorized. A lot of times stress um, stems from people wanting to feel as though they're needed, they're important, They have a purpose in life, and they're mistaking stress for that basic human need, right? So it isn't all bad, and we have to stop looking at everything that we go through in our lives as as the bad word, stress. So again, this is a funny slide. I'm sorry this is the best I could find, but look at everything that stress does to your body. First of all, asthma, stress and asthma related. Of course, we know with the heart, high blood pressure, um, arrhythmias, high cholesterol. High cholesterol. I mean, did you know that stress can cause high cholesterol? It's because of the inflammation. Diabetes, acne, rashes, hives, eczema, weakened ability to combat and recover from illness in our immune system. Our intestines, it affects our digestion, right? I think we all have had that experience. Aches and pains and muscle tension. Um, Arthritis is affected by stress. 
our reproductive system. You know, my husband and I um, were not able to have children, and a long time ago we were going to a, a specialist, and he was just trying to tell us to just relax and and be, um, you know, go on vacation together and go to a beach or wherever you find it relaxing, and you'll, you're more likely to conceive. At the time, I thought that was kind of, you know, <laughs> I don't know. At the time, I didn't think that that was very helpful, but now I see the connection. <laughs> Uh, the stomach, stomach cramps, acid reflux, nausea and ulcers, and then the head, headaches, depression, irritability, sadness, lack of energy. Basically, I mean, this is your life, right? And this is what stress does to it, creates illness. Well, what does God say? Well, God says, be still and know that I am God. He just says, be still. Now, when I give uh, retreats, I've given several women's retreats this year, and it's been a fun exercise. I've, I've started out on Saturday mornings saying, okay, you know, everybody get, comes in the room, and they're all ready to go. They're raring to go. It's like first day of a retreat. And I said, you know, in Isaiah, God told the Israelites to just chill out. This is my own wording. <laughs> chill out. Just rest in him, and he would take care of them, Right? He said, don't worry about anything. I've got you covered. And what did the Israelites do? They jumped on their horses and they took off. And God's like, wait a minute. I I just told you that I would take care of you. Just rest in me. But they thought that they had to take everything under their own control. So what I say in my retreats is this is how we're going to start this retreat. And then I lead them in silence for about 10 minutes. And I can tell from the feeling in the room that a lot of people are uncomfortable with this because I'm, I'm saying some prayers while we do it, but they're uncomfortable with silence. They don't just sit. And this is one of the most important things that you can do. Studies have shown that if you can start your day with silence, it can change the whole course of your day. It lowers your inflammation in your body. It balances your hormones. It does all kinds of incredible things. So what I promote is prayerful silence. Now, I know that we use the word meditation a lot. And in in this conference, whenever we talk about meditation, we're all on the same page. But I know when I talk about meditation to my clients, a lot of them think, oh, you know, Cynthia's talking about some new agey kind of thing, right? But meditation just means to engage in contemplation or reflection, to focus one's thoughts and to reflect on or ponder over. And even in Philippians 4, 8, we're told, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate upon these things. So what's the difference between Christian meditation and secular meditation? Christian meditation is based on prayer, knowing God is at the center of our silence, as opposed to the way I was taught meditation when I was in school, which is to completely empty yourself and to become one with the universe and to try to get be enlightened, right? And like my spiritual father said a long time ago, I remember, he said that, um, you know, this whole meditation thing, he said, you know, why would you want to sit and completely empty yourself Because you know what they said in the Bible when the man emptied himself. All the demons came in. He swept his house clean and even more demons came in. So you want to keep God at the center. But the premise is the same. It's the silence. You had a question, George? No, no. Okay. All right. I saw you raise your hand. Okay. So what do the saints and the elders say? Well, first of all, Elder Thaddeus, I love him. Have you all read Mm -hmm. Our Thoughts Determine Our Lives? I love that book. Our life depends on the kind of thoughts we nurture. If our thoughts are peaceful, calm, meek, and kind, then that's what our life is like. If our attention is turned to the circumstances in which we live, we are drawn into a whirlpool of thoughts and can have neither peace nor tranquility. Our thoughts can create heaven or hell around us in this world. If you haven't read that book, he has fabulous advice for a stress-free life. And even how it relates to disease, which I really appreciated. St. Seraphim of Serov, 
says, When the mind and heart are united in prayer and the soul's thoughts are not dispersed, the heart is warmed by spiritual warmth in which the light of Christ shines, making the whole inner man peaceful and joyous. So isn't that beautiful? So scripture is calling us into silence. The elders and the saints are proponents of silence. How many of us practice silence? It's very difficult. I understand. I'm going to, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But then what do studies say? So this is based on meditation, but this transfers over to prayerful silence. The benefits. Increased intelligence improves cognitive and intellectual abilities. Efficiency, better decision making. <clears throat> Excuse me, higher creativity and problem solving, higher brain integration. Positive emotions and well being, five times greater gamma output, which are the oxytocin related feelings. Better personal relationships and increased patience. Higher life expectancy, mortality rates from various fatal heart conditions are cut by 48% people who meditate, better sleep cycles. It's just, it's amazing, especially even if you're practicing prayerful silence in the morning, it helps your sleep the following night. It's incredible how that works, the science behind it. Better skin, lower blood pressure, increased immune system, slower aging, And helpful for cancer, multiple sclerosis, autism, drug addiction, depression, eating disorders, smoking, PTSD, and ADHD. So why aren't we all doing this more, right? Why aren't we just spending, I don't know, an extra 10 minutes, 15 minutes keeping prayerful silence? And we haven't even gotten into deep breathing, the additional benefits of intentional deep breathing manage, is managing stress, managing anxiety, lowering blood sugar and heart rate, sparking brain growth, and changing gene expression. So what I like to do when I do lead people through a prayerful silence is we always start out with three breaths. Now, one of my um, teachers was Dr. Andrew Weil, which some of you may know. He's the one who taught me a breathing exercise that I've kind of modified a little bit for my clients but what um, you do, and, and it reminded me too when we were in the uh, uh, workshop earlier and she was leading us through a breathing and stress reduction exercise, which was so wonderful. But she had us all, you know, take some breaths. But here's the important thing. You have to breathe in the right way. And as I learned from my chiropractor, most people don't breathe in the right way. We're all breathing shallow up through the top of our chest, right? We're supposed to be filling our lungs like it's a pitcher from the bottom up. So when you take a deep breath in, your chest should just be remaining stable and your stomach should be going out. So it's to, like to a count of seven. And then you hold it a couple counts. And then you whoosh it out. If you do that three times, it engages your parasympathetic nervous system. If you find yourself in the middle of the day feeling you know, stress and you're overwhelmed and you can't think straight, do three of those. Your parasympathetic nervous system will kick in and you'll be able to actually be able to control your blood pressure, control your heart rate. Everything comes down and you'll automatically start feeling start feeling less stressed. Plus, it brings oxygen into your brain at the same time, and you'll be able to think clearly. So one of the things that I have in place, and almost everything I do, is called a daily ascesis. And ascesis is one of those words where I've even had Orthodox Christians say, like, uh, Cynthia, ascesis, really? You know, can't you use a different word? But I love this word. I just found out it's one of the 30... 30 how did, how did the dictionary say this? The bottom 30% of words <laughs> used, which is, you know, we're orthodox. We're used to asceticism and, you know, et cetera. So we know this better than anybody. But my goal in life is to get this word really, really pop popular. So anyway, self-discipline and asceticism. And what I like to promote is a daily ascesis. So this starts a day with an intentional tone. This is how I start mine. First, I drank a big glass of lemon water because, as you may know, lemon water has so many benefits. 
alkalizes your body so that disease doesn't grow. It can decrease inflammation, start your metabolism going, all kinds of wonderful things. Practice prayerful silence, devotions and study, do some stretching. I go for my 30-minute walk. I have my healthy breakfast. And you know what? I just put my own oxygen mask on first. Now I can be the best person for everybody else I'm going to run into during the day. I can be the best me that I can be. And that's so important. Yes? What does that take you? This takes me about an hour. Yeah. Yeah, not too long. I mean, you build it into your day. You have to be intentional about it for sure. But, but as we saw earlier, the, the um, ramifications of doing something like this are so awesome that, you know, why wouldn't you want to take the time, right? So speak. Right, right. So let's get into the next one, speaking of breakfast, because what do you have for breakfast, right? Are you having pancakes with syrup and all kinds of stuff? <laughs> no, you want a high-protein breakfast, and that's a whole different talk when I tell you what you know we should be eating. But we are going to get into food. And food is information. Now, when I was in school... I learned over 100 dietary theories. Everyone is bioindividual. That's why if someone else had a great uh, uh, result following Weight Watchers, for instance, it worked for them, but it doesn't work for you. Or someone else tried the Atkins diet, worked for them, doesn't work for you. Someone's eating paleo, worked for them, not for you. Everyone is bioindividual. Everyone is also genetically individual. So that plays a whole nother role in knowing what you should eat, what you should start your day out with, etc. But there are some general rules of thumb. My teachers, um, it was interesting because one would get up on stage and would start talking to us. And, um, you know, veganism, you know, no meat, no dairy, no animal products, you know, no animal cruelty. Veganism is the way to go and had all these studies and research and everything. And you, I'm just writing furiously like, oh, my gosh, yes, everyone, you know, no one should eat animal products. And then the next guy would get up and say, oh, paleo, back to, you know, <laughs> our ancestors. We have to have meat and, <coughs> excuse me, and he had all these studies and research to back it up, and it was awesome. And I'm writing furiously, oh, must eat meat. You know, <laughs> it was just like all these people had all these different opinions and grain and no grain, and, you know, and it just got crazy. And you know what? I just decided I'm going to take mine back to Scripture. This is going to be my rule of thumb. And God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed. <clears throat> which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose, whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. You know what all these people had in common? A plant-based diet is the healthiest diet that you can have. And isn't it interesting? God gave us plants first. So, okay, I'm not, I'm not uh, confused any longer. Then, Genesis 9, a lot of stuff happened. The fall, the flood, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, and the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the air, on all that move on the earth and all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. If God gave me meat to eat, I see no reason why it shouldn't be eaten. Some people do better, like when we're fasting during Lent, for instance, or Advent, and they're not eating any dairy products or meat products for all that period, and they feel fabulous, that's awesome. That's the kind of body type that they have. They need to run with that. You take my husband, and you don't give him animal products for Lent, by the time Pascha rolls around, I mean, he'll eat that entire leg of lamb. You know, I mean, he's just like, he can barely move through the house. So again, different body types, different genetics. We're all bio-individual. But there are some um, things that we all need to watch out for. And we're going to get into that right now. So as we said, inflammation is the root of disease. Well, what causes inflammation? We're going to get into that. But let's go back to 2004, Time Magazine, The Secret Killer. 
the surprising link between inflammation and heart attacks, cancer, Alzheimer's, and other diseases. So 2004. So first we have Hippocrates telling us way back when that it, disease all begins in the gut. Now we have 2004 Time Magazine talking about inflammation being the silent killer. So we're, what, 13 years past this? People are still not really honing in on inflammation and getting rid of inflammation in their bodies. And what we, can we do about inflammation? That should be the big topic amongst, in my humble opinion, doctors and their patients these days. So that's why they have, we have health coaches. So toxins create inflammation. Here are just some examples. Bad fats, we're going to go over those. Excitotoxins or glutamines. Artificial anything. Um, dyes come under this heading. I mean, these are basically chemical concoctions. Preservatives, sugar, processing, and chemical insecticides and herbicides. Now, um, well, I was just going to say something, but I'm going to wait on that one. So first, let's go into fats. And Oh, and I want to let you guys know at the end, I'm going to show you where you can go on my website and get this in writing. So don't worry about taking notes or anything. So I've got you covered. So what they found is that with fats, there are good fats and bad fats. Not all fat is bad, like it was once villainized, right? Um, olive oil, coconut oil, avocado oil, nuts and seeds, and grass-fed butter are good fats. They actually lower inflammation in our bodies. We have to make sure that we have this type of fat with every meal because that's what's going to slow down um, carbohydrates in our system from turning into sugar, from raising our blood sugar, etc. So we need those good fats. Bad fats, vegetable oil, canola oil, corn oil, peanut oil, safflower, and sunflower oil, those are all ones that create inflammation. Now, how many of you read ingredient labels on the products you buy at the store before you buy? Awesome. And what do you read on the ingredient labels? What's the first thing you go to? And I'm asking questions, and I know the mic is right there, and Tanya's looking at me like, talk loud. Talk loud. OK. <clears throat> So what's the first thing you look at on the label before you decide to buy something? Calories. Calories? OK. Fat content. Fat content, sugar content. Preservatives. Preservatives. I look at the list. You look at the ingredient list? OK, you get the gold star. You rise to the top of the class, because that's exactly, that's the only thing on that label that doesn't lie. And you were, you were right in there with preservatives. <laughs> Because, okay, the front of the label that says um, low-fat, heart-healthy, organic, da-da-da-da-da, all this stuff that makes it sound wonderful, it, it, that's marketing. Ignore that. You go to the back, and it says fat grams, sugar grams, carbohydrates, protein. Don't go by that. That lies. Is there anyone here that, who buys spray oil? Yeah? Yeah, well... If you look at the spray oil, how much fat is in a can of spray oil? How many uh, grams of fat? Zero. How can that be? Oil is a fat. You spray that on your cookie sheet, and you run your finger through it, and it's greasy. It's a fat. They can say it has zero fat in it because they take the ratio of the actual oil in the can to the ratio of the propellant that sprays it out to the ratio of how fast your finger, <laughs> which I can't even do it, can hit the top of that spray nozzle. That comes out to a percentage, and that's a loophole that allows them to say there's no fat in there. That's why you can't believe those numbers. You look at fat grams. I don't care how many fat grams are in something. I care where that fat came from. If that ca fat came from olive oil, heart healthy, lowers inflammation, feeds my brain cells, balances my hormones. If it came from canola oil, forget it. Does the opposite of all that. Creates inflammation, creates disease. So fat grams means nothing. So it's the ingredient label that doesn't lie. Well, they have sneaky ways of getting things on that label that I'm going to go over today. Um, and a lot of the, you know, the long words and everything are typically preservatives. You know, what I like to think of is, 
It's the kitchen test. If you look at that ingredient label and you can replicate it in your own kitchen, it's okay, typically, unless you have canola oil in your kitchens, but I'm going to assume you're not after this. But um, if you have, you know, diasodium phosphate, blah, 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 in a bottle in your kitchen, you probably don't, so don't buy it, right? It's not for you. So that brings me to a uh, 60 Minutes um, article. This was way back in, golly, I want to say it was like 2007, um, on 60 Minutes, and they were talking about excitotoxins. And it was called Tweaking Tastes and Creating Cravings, and it's on YouTube if you want to watch it. What they were talking about was how the scientists and food companies come together in their labs, and they create chemical concoctions that influence an addictive response in your brain and create your brain cells, you know, make your brain cells go, oh my gosh, this is so good, I want more and more and more and more of this, and it creates addiction. That's what they want to do because they want you to buy their food. So in this expose, they went into one area, and I, and, I, and I think this is the part that's taken, this picture's taken from the part where they're testing raspberry flavors. So all of these vials back there are different nuances of raspberry flavors that have been created out of chemicals. So whenever you see something um, that is called caramel color, natural flavors, right? This is where they get you, because you think, oh, natural flavors. That's so much better for me than artificial flavors. And I'm going to get back to that in a minute. Textured protein, soy protein, all of these are actually excitotoxins that are killing your brain cells off faster than they're already dying off. It's creating an addictive response in your brain, and it's causing inflammation and disease. So you don't want this at all. I had a client... Um, a couple years ago, she wanted my help to get healthy, to reach her health goals, to guide her and, and everything. And I, I'm doing that. And then about three sessions in, she tells me that she's a food scientist because I started talking about excitotoxins. She said, oh, yes. She said, I'm a food scientist. And I actually worked on a project between a major food company and the FDA to determine what could be put into food that wouldn't harm people and you know, what was safe. And she said, the funny thing is, natural flavors has more, uh, can have more dangerous compounds in them than artificial flavors. So it was good to hear directly from her, too, since she'd actually been on the team, which is also interesting because it was the FDA working in conjunction with the major food company to figure out what was safe for us. The other thing that happens when um, they're te testing, and I don't care if this is food or if this is um, body products. You know, the body product industry is not regulated. They're self-regulated. They can do testing on one chemical and say, well, you know, that's okay. If this percentage of chemical is put on your skin, um, it's not going to hurt you. Well, the fact is that within 16 seconds, whatever you put on your skin goes into your bloodstream, so you might as well have eaten it. They also don't test on, well, what if they put these 20 chemicals together? What kind of toxic burden does that put on a person? They don't do that kind of testing. Same thing for food. So, you, so take a diet soda, for instance, with natural flavors and caramel color and a bunch of this stuff in it, and you've got basically a toxic bomb going off in your body. Preservatives. Again, you know, a lot of these, if, if you can't pronounce it, don't buy it. There's another rule of thumb for me. Preservatives, by their very nature, why are they put into food? Pardon me? Keep it from spoiling. Keep it from spoiling. And, and how, do you, how do you keep food from spoiling? You kill the bacteria. Okay? So preservatives are put in food to kill bacteria. This is where it really hit home for me because I always knew, oh, preservatives are bad. Don't eat preservatives. Our microbiome, our gut, is created of bacteria, healthy bacteria that's meant to help us thrive and keep our immune system strong. It's, it, it's what makes us alive. We are actually more bacteria than we are cells. We have more bacteria in our bodies. We're walking bacteria more than we're walking cells. 
you put preservatives in your body, it doesn't discern, oh, this is a good bacteria or bad bacteria. It's killing the, your very life. Yes, start. My wife and I actually take a, uh, a, 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 a bacteria for the mouth. It actually is good bacteria for the mouth so that we colonize uh, the back, our mouth with good bacteria that's not going to cause tooth decay, so there's no place for the bacteria that uh, can cause tooth Terrific. decay in gums. Do you take that in pill form, or what kind of form is Actually, that? We, it's, it's, in, it's in a little capsule, and we chew it, and we hold it in our mouth for a while, so it goes throughout the mouth, and, and don't drink anything for like 10 to 20 minutes afterwards, so that it actually colonizes the mouth. Very interesting, very interesting. So the same thing. So they're trying to recolonize the good bacteria, which is why we take probiotics, we eat fermented foods like yogurt, etc., to recolonize that good bacteria. But do you see why, like, this is why it really hit home for me, and maybe it did for you too. This is why we don't want preservatives. Okay, sugar. Well, sugar um, comes in a lot of different um, forms, a lot of different uh, uh, names. Here's, here's my thought on sugar. So... How many of you had chocolate cake last night? Exactly. I didn't, only because I, I can't do gluten, so I didn't get cake, but it wasn't because of the sugar. I love chocolate cake. But I figure I'm going to eat sugar. I mean, life is good. Sugar is part of it. <laughs> but I want it in my dessert. If I'm going to have a treat once in a while or a dessert once in a while, or eat cake at you know my goddaughter's birthday party or whatever. I don't see anything wrong with that. But it's the hidden sugars that's in the food that we buy that's hurting us. If you're looking at ingredient labels, reading those labels, sugar is put into just about everything. It is, and it's it, and not only is it put into everything, but it's also low quality sugars, highly processed sugars, uh, chemical sugars that are put into what we're eating. Now, let me think here. I was going to talk about, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. I'll get it back. I'll get it back. But it's, it's you know, sugar causes inflammation. That was the other main thing that I got out of all these dietary theories. Everyone was basically in agreement that plant-based diets are good for you. Everyone was in agreement that sugar is poison. Okay, So it's just limiting it, in my opinion, that is the important thing and making sure that it's not getting in uh, to your other food. Oh, I know what I was going to say. So back uh, 25 years ago, you know, the low-fat scare. You know, fat's bad for you. Got to have low-fat. Got to have no fat. You know, you're killing yourself with the fat. Do you know who paid for those research studies to be done at major universities in this country? Sugar. The sugar industry. <laughs> so what happens when you take fat out of a product? What do you do to make it taste good? Yeah, you put sugar in it. <laughs> it's crazy, right? And then that's also where the things, like if we went back to um, the excitotoxins, carrageenan started being put in things because it creates that creamy feel that, that fat doesn't give. So that's when all this chemical junk started being put into our food, and that's where, um, you know, ever since the, the um, low fat or the fat scare, that's when diabetes and obesity started going up. The chart is phenomenal when you take a look at the chart. So the next thing I had talked about on that first slide was um, insecticides and herbicides, and of course this is why we talk about eating clean. Um, I know a lot of people can't afford organic produce or organic meats, organic grass-fed meat. You know, you can really um, spend a lot of money there. One trick that I use for the things that I can't buy organic or can't afford to buy organic, when I bring it home, I give it a bath in one-third vinegar and two-thirds water. I fill my basin with it, and I just throw everything in there. I let it sit for about 10 minutes. And that will get rid of about 99% of the insecticide and herbicide on the outside of the produce. It's still on the inside, but at least you're cutting your, 
you know, your disease profile there. Um, for things like berries or other tender things, I have a spray bottle under my sink of vinegar water that I spray with. So you don't have to buy those fancy, you know, at the store, those special veggie washes or whatever. It's just white vinegar and water. So any questions about food? Because we're going to move off of the food topic. So the dirty dozen oh. is these are things because of pesticides and insecticides? Yes. The EWG, how many of you guys know about the EWG, Environmental Working Group? This is an awesome organization. E EWG.org online. And every year they came out with a dirty dozen and clean 15. So if you're watching your money and you have to um, buy non-organic of some things, buy apples, strawberries, grapes, celery, etc., definitely organic because they are the dirtiest, most heavily laden insecticide foods that are on the produce shelf. Go ahead and buy non-organic avocados, sweet potatoes, cauliflower, etc. This changes every year, so make sure you go to the website because it does change. Um, something great about the EWG also is that they have an app called Clean Living, I believe, and you can put it on your phone and um, when you're at the store you can scan labels and it'll tell you um, how likely it is to affect your reproductive system, how likely it is to cause cancer, how likely it is to um, do all kinds of things. So it's a great, great resource. Question? Yes? Are you going to talk about um, full fast, complete fasting at all? Or should I ask that now? Um, I, I just yeah, go ahead and ask it now. Who's, uh, it's really an expert in ecology, but he was saying that really to clean out toxins out of our body, doing a regular complete fast of everything, because it's just a day and a night is really, really helpful. I just wanted your opinion on that. It feels like fasting, as we fast and look at our church, is really yeah. important, but he's also saying that you know, if you can fast with everything except water, Okay, I do know that some people do recommend that, and for some people it works. For some people it could be the worst thing that they do. Because if your liver is already overburdened by toxins, and your body starts dumping toxins into an already taxed out liver, you can cause failure. So you've got to be really careful about all these fasts, water fast, juice fast, cabbage fast, you know, all the crazy things out there. You've got to be very careful because before you do any type of detoxification program, you have to make sure that your body is prepared for it. And there's a certain system that you should go by. Of course, very different from, you know, orthodox fasting and the way we do it. So, and you know what's really incredible is um, the way we fast as orthodox, mm -hmm. by taking out... Um, everything that we take out, it creates a detoxification process in our body and starts turning around disease and healing ourselves within three weeks. And I just look at the church and it's, um, I don't know, it's wisdom and how the church was led to take us through these fasting times and sure they're spiritual times but the effects on our body are so uh, renewing and we're just now, science is just now getting around to understanding that. So let's talk about sleep. So before I started uh, getting into health coaching, I, I was in the corporate world. And uh, after years and years of selling, um, actually, computer projection equipment, um, I realized I wasn't saving any lives. <laughs> I was just living a very stressed lifestyle. Um, very little sleep. I had bosses who uh, prided themselves on only needing four or five hours of sleep a night, and they would definitely promote that with the people who worked for them. So habitually, I was in late night meetings in bars getting ready for a meeting the next day until like 11 o'clock midnight, and then getting up at six the next morning to also work on presentations, and, and it was nuts. And now I know part of why my body broke down during that time period. Um, not only was it the bad eating out of hotels and restaurants most of my life, but it was also the lack of sleep. Here's what sleep deprivation does to you. 
decreases growth in children, first of all, and premature aging in adults. It decreases your immune system, memory loss, and the inability to learn. You know, when you sleep, um, that's when your lymphatic system kicks in. So all the brain cells that have died during the day, this is when your body is able to move them out of your body. So if you're not sleeping, they start building up, and they found out with Alzheimer's patients that this is one of the issues with Alzheimer's patients. Their brains, their lymphatic system has started shutting down. So we're like basically causing an Alzheimer's reaction by not sleeping. Memory loss, uh, impaired ability to process information, weight issues for multiple reasons because your hormones are not balanced, um, all kinds of things. Diabetes, toxin buildup, accelerated tumor growth two to three times faster, and one night of four to five hours um, of sleep causes brain dysfunction and mood swings. So that's how important sleep is to us. A lot of people I know have a hard time sleeping, and, they, and there are a lot of different reasons for this, and this is one of the things I work with people on is how to, how to sleep better. But one of the things I like to tell them is, first of all, optimize your environment. Make sure that you're in total darkness, because even a little bit of light coming in can keep you from REM sleep. Make sure the temperature is cool enough. They say that 62, 63 degrees is really the optimal temperature to sleep in. EMFs, you turn off your Wi-Fi at night. Don't let those EMFs um, affect your sleep because they definitely do. People who sleep next to their cell phone found out just a few months ago that my mother-in-law was sleeping with her cell phone under her pillow for some weird reason, like an emergency or whatever. I don't know, but we stopped that right away. Um, and the purpose of a bed, I mean, it's for you know sleeping and being with your spouse. It's not for working. Right, So keep that space sacred, and that's been known to help. And then something that I do is, here's this word again, create an evening ascesis. So save time every night, or, or same time every night, go to bed. And that's when you cut off blue light. If you're getting blue light from your computer screen, your television screen, your iPad, it doesn't matter, your body thinks, hey, it's time to wake up and go, go, go. Your serotonin keeps your, your uh, melatonin from kicking in. So people who go right from their computer to bed and wonder why they can't sleep, often this is the problem. So by cutting off that blue light at least an hour before you go to bed, that can help a lot. And a lot of people wear those blue, blue blocker glasses for this reason so that um, they can go ahead and work or whatever they want to do, watch TV before bed, and it's not going to affect their hormone balance. Chamomile tea, an Epsom salt bath. You know, Epsom salts are magnesium. Magnesium will relax your muscles. It'll also relax your brain. Lavender, I'm a bit, big proponent of essential oils. A lavender is definitely one that I use. I spray on my uh, pillow, a, a lavender and a water spray. Uh, prayer, always, of course. Journal a little bit. I always read. And then up at the same time every morning. By doing this at the same time, weekends, weekdays, you can create your circadian rhythm. You can stabilize your circadian rhythm. And a lot of people's rhythms are so far off that you really have to go into a regimented schedule to bring it back together. This, this, this might be contrary to what you say, but uh, my, my father was a physician uh, in a small town in Central Florida during the 50s and the 60s, and if somebody had difficulty going to sleep or staying asleep, uh, the only thing he'd give them was a highly addictive barbiturate. So he'd tell them to drink a beer, mm -hmm. and you drink the beer because the alcohol is a nervous system depressant, and the hop is a muscle relaxant. Yep. Yep. We'll put so you I, I, I'm, as an expert physician, I prescribe beer to all my patients. Yeah, oh, I prescribe beer, but not a barbiturate. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. My dad actually had a case of tall boy beers in his medicine closet, and people mm -hmm. walked out of his office with a six pack under their arm. Is that right? <laughs> I have some clients who would love your dad. <laughs> so here's my advice put together your health team. Now, this is something that, um, and I don't know if it's just generations before us where people have just assumed that their doctor is in charge of their health and not themselves, right? Um, whatever my doctor says goes, 
you know, I'm not going to do any research. I'm not, you know, I don't have a voice here. If I tell him that I have, uh, you know, if I, we find out I have high cholesterol and he says take a statin, I don't even ask why or what else can I do. You know, I just do it. So put together your health team, you as the CEO and your own health advocate. Recently, um, do any of you know of Dr. Stephen Gundry? Um, he is a world-renowned cardiologist, and he uh, tells this great story about a patient of his. His name is Big Ed. And Big Ed was big, and he had some major heart issues, and he needed a heart surgery. And he went around to all these surgeons, and none of them would do it because of his profile, and it, it was, it, you know, it could have killed him. So none of the surgeons would do this. So he found Dr. Gundry, finally made his way to Dr. Gundry. Dr. Gundry looks at him, he's like, you know, I, I agree, I, I, I wouldn't do this surgery on you. And he says, well, wait a minute, you know, I've been doing some things for the last six months, and I want you to look at my recent blood work. And he pulled out his blood work. And Dr. Gundry looks at it, and he's like, wow, this, like, this doesn't even look like the same person. What have you been doing? He says, well, you know, I've started eating a certain way, and I take all these supplements, and he had like a bag of supplements. And up until then, Dr. Gundry was like, the only good, you know, the only thing supplements do is create expensive urine. That was his, you know, position on supplements. And um, anyway he realized that the supplements that Big Ed was taking were, a lot of them were the same things that he himself was giving his patients during their surgeries through an IV to keep them alive. He never thought of them being used as prophylactic. And also, he realized that the way that Big Ed was eating was something that he had written about in a term paper when he was in med school on something about turning an ape into a human or something weird, but anyway. So he, being a doctor, he said he was like one of his best case, or worst case scenarios, his own blood work and his, well first Big Ed, he went ahead and did the surgery because Big Ed changed his life, changed his lifestyle on his own, took his own health into his hands. Did the surgery, came through with flying colors, a great story. Dr. Gundry turned all this on himself, changed his medical profile, lost a ton of weight, he's healthy again. At this point, he's worked with thousands of patients who have taken supplements, changed their lifestyle, have started eating differently, no longer have inflammation, no longer have any symptoms of fibromyalgia, uh, um, rheumatoid arthritis, other autoimmune disease issues. This all started with Big Ed, who became his own CEO and health advocate. So here's what you do. First of all, health professionals, Find health professionals who have the same mindset you do. Just like there are people that go to a doctor and they just want to be given a pill, there are health professionals who just want to give you a pill. There are some people who don't want to be given a pill because they know all the terrible side effects and they want to do things naturally and get to the root cause of things. There are doctors who are trained to do that. So make sure that you get the right medical team on your case. Interview them. You know how now... If you want to establish um, being a patient with a doctor, you, know, you have to go in ahead of time, even if, even if you're not sick, to establish you know, that you're their patient. It's a two-way street. You're interviewing them, too. So I think this is what a, a lot of people I talk to don't understand. You're interviewing them, not necessarily the other way around. So be careful with who you choose. Friends and family. There's a famous quote by Jim Rohn. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. You're hanging around with people who are hanging out at bars, you're going to drink more. You're hanging around with people who go to fast food restaurants, you're going to eat more fast food. Hanging around with people where you go over to their houses and there's bowls of candy all over the place, you're going to eat candy. So be careful. Pick who you're going to be spending your time with, people who are going to support you, people who aren't going to, you know, you come over to their house and they say, here, have a ding-dong, right? Community church community, other communities that support a healthy lifestyle. Um, God willing, next year I'm coming out with a program called the Healthy Table, which is for parishes, so that they can have a healthy um, table during their coffee hours after liturgy, so that your decision to either eat the donut holes or the, you know, whatever, you know, you're not going to have to worry. You can go to a table where you know it's safe. And then a coach or a mentor. Every successful person uses a coach or a mentor. 
You have um, a medical issue, you go to a health professional, a doctor. You have um, marital issues, you go to a family counselor. You have you know, all kinds of issues. You go to someone who can lead you, mentor you, and coach you. And that's what health coaches do. We take you, um, we know you better than anybody knows you. We sit down with you, it's all about you. We find out your, um, your strengths, your weaknesses, your past, your medical profile, what, how you're eating, what your relationships are like, where you're at spiritually. We put the whole thing together and work with you. So even if you don't hire a health coach, you know, find somebody who you respect, who knows what they're talking about, and have a mentor. Put together your team. I love this, Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. This world is setting us up for what we see all around us. Disease, disorder, all kinds of stuff. We can move against that. We just have to be informed. We have to start reading labels. We have to start managing our stress. And I just want to leave you with a really quick story again. I'm, out, I'm almost out of time, right? Okay. Real quickly. So, I always have a hard time with this, and I get emotional. But um, one of the reasons I became a health coach was because of my Aunt Irene. And uh, she spent her entire life obese and in pain diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. She had a tough life. And then she ended up with Alzheimer's. And when we found out she had Alzheimer's, I became her um, POA, her primary caregiver. I hired a caregiver to live with her 24-7. I took over what she ate. Now, she was the person who went into Costco and bought the big muffins and, you know, drank pop and and everything. But... um, That's not the way I'm feeding her, obviously, because I don't believe in that. So, and this was even before I went to school. Um, I just started buying the groceries that I knew was healthy. I gave the caregiver a menu of what I wanted her to cook for my aunt. I made sure that she was out walking every day. I have her lifting weights. She's 85 years old at the time. Lifting weights, because I knew she needed to keep her, her arms strong. And I just, you know, set this up, not even thinking. Within eight months, she was off of all of her medications. She had been on 12 meds. No longer in pain. She's lost 60 pounds. She is healthier and happier than she's ever been. No diabetes, no high blood pressure, no high cholesterol. And I thought, this is incredible. Like, I knew all this stuff was healthy, but, you know, I've never seen a turnaround in this 85-year-old woman. And then not long after that, I was in Washington with my parents and my dad was in the hospital. Um, His death certificate said that he died of like eight different things. It was crazy. And I looked at that and I thought, oh my gosh, I know that so many of these things could have been avoided. So many of these things he had control over if he had only known, if I could have only helped him. And that's why I went to school became a health coach because I want to help people turn around their lives. And now my aunt, she's 92 years old. Again, I think that we've stabilized her Alzheimer's. She didn't go downhill as fast as I think that she would have. Um, Again, happy, healthy, content. Thanks be to God, and um, thank you for coming to my presentation today.